Hey, we got it. All right. So um, we're going to turn it over to the hands of Craig. Let Craig pray us in and get started with our teaching. Come on, Brother Craig. Lord, I just ask you tonight for the open mind, the discovery of new things. Lord, allow us to see and hear things the way you know them to be. Help us pierce truth like we've never pierced before. In Jesus' name. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to cover something first. I want to do a little preparation because there's a lot of things like, and, and Shannon's out, bring this to my attention. Um, just in mention, he's not talked to me about this. So, um, when I reference things like in an activation that we close our eyes and, you know, and this is backed up in the scripture that if you see it, you have done it. So, and it actually was in a negative context. If you look upon a woman and lust upon her, if you're actually, while you're doing that, you are violating in the spirit. So as we see, we do. These are things that we need to kind of understand because we were first spirit man. <clears throat> Sorry, girls. You're just going to be included in this one. <clears throat> but it's okay. I've got to be a bride too. So it's fair. As my spirit man is, and I was first, we became dependent into the flesh, which left us deaf and dumb. So when we operate in the flesh that has sinful, that has a sinful nature, I don't get the check when I go to do something wrong. When I'm in the spirit, Holy Spirit gets to mule kick me and go, <clears throat> excuse me, what do you think you're doing? Oh, yeah, about that. Oops. But I can follow the unction because my door is open. So when I'm actually doing an activation and I encourage people to close their eyes, you don't actually have to. Um it's a good practice to start with. But the reason why I do that is it, it removes distraction and it helps us train ourselves to stepping into our prayer closet. Down the road, you can walk right into your prayer closet, mid-sentence, walking down the street, talking with somebody and having somebody else talking to you. You can do all of this at one time. It is not a problem. You don't have to stop and engage what we're slowly will learn to do. And what I've tried to do with me for years is walk in my prayer closet so I can pray without ceasing. Praying without ceasing means I leave my spiritual door open so I can see what the Father shows and I can hear what the father says. Now, that's what Jesus said about father. Now that Jesus has actually went through the cross, it's now our turn to do it with Jesus just the same. He was our role model. So I can see and hear as Jesus shows me every part of the day throughout the day, as long as I keep my spiritual door open. It's different. I've had prayers like, Lord, help me, um, help me function in the unction. That way it's like, ooh, okay, uh, what am I supposed to be doing here? But I feel the nudge. It's these little things that take place. And if you want to get into spiritual warfare, I'm going to wreck your understanding of what that is tonight. <clears throat> but if you're going to be in spiritual warfare, you need to make sure that you're keeping your spiritual door open. We do everything under the guidance. 
the path is narrow, but the gate is wide. So we've got a narrow path. Now, here's the cool thing about this. Are you going to mess up? Yep. Is it, it, will it ever get so screwed up it can't be fixed? You're right. It always can be fixed. I want you, uh, here's the, dis, here's the disclaimer. Jesus works with an imperfect kind perfectly. If you look at me as infallible, I want to screw up immediately so we can get that off of the table. I am human. I live in error. My theology is full of error and my religion is more jacked up because I don't understand the writing of the Bible as it was instructed with the inside of heaven. See, it's a disadvantage. The devil came from heaven and he understands the words of the Bible to a deeper, more intimate level than we do because he started there. We didn't. So it's not fair to actually hold yourself accountable to the level of perfection because we lost that before we even learned what the word meant. That's why he's called us to righteous, just meaning freshly repented. So if you think this walk is in perfection, it can be. We don't start there. The perfection is through Christ and his blood. That perfection and the perfecting actually comes through the cleansing of the blood and the repenting of the mind. Now, why would I say all of this? The righteous prophet. The righteous prophet died, and when they threw a dead body on him, he sprung to life and ran out of the pit. That's the power of righteousness. Meaning freshly repented. We start walking in the supernatural. We start walking in his power, not ours. Doesn't matter how strong I am, how much I can dead deadlift. Doesn't matter if I can curl 80 pounds um in fact in the old testament it actually says father's not impressed with the strength of our legs so there's nothing i can do in the flesh that actually makes me look strong be more dominant and be more powerful because the way of heaven operates totally different so how do you walk in power well, you receive the kingdom of God. I'm going to stress this. The kingdom of God is defined as Holy Spirit. Now, he can come to us to be on or in. On is not near as strong as in. In, you must actually carry an invitation. Then he comes in. That's the difference of a lot of religions that want to argue the fact, I've got the Holy Spirit. Well, yeah, you do. And we don't have to argue about if you speak in tongues or not. But did he come on you or come in you? Have you invited him? He's a perfect gentleman, just like Christ. So under invitation, he'll come in. The purpose is for possession. That'll scare a lot of people. If I could be possessed by the Holy Spirit, let him sear my flesh into something more heavenly, why would we not want to go there? Other than the fact that the possession of a demonic activity is kind of frightening. We've all been hindered by the enemy. And I don't care if they were around, on, or in. It's still oppression. That's all it is. Their job is to oppress. Now, 
why why is it constant why do we have a deliverance ministry and why do we fight in the spirit well the devil knew we were a possessable kind so he threw a whole lot of possessors to challenge our territory to come take our territory by force sometimes we just hand it over but because we're a possessable kind, let's get back to the original intent and design. It was never to be possessed by the enemy. But the enemy knew we were possessable. We became possessable so we could receive the greatest gift there ever was. Jesus said, it is better for me to leave so I can give you the Holy Spirit. When we receive the Holy Spirit, now we receive one of the three of the omnipotent. And we walk in the power of the king of all spirits. Now. Warfare. I pull out a sword, I call it kindness, so I can kill you with kindness. That is exactly what spiritual warfare in the Christian community is. As long as we're killing you with kindness, I guess it's okay to shoot the wounded. <clears throat> There is no place in the Bible that actually says you are to go out, conjure up power, and start whooping people with the fire of God. The sons of thunder go out. Why don't you smoke them? Who, who watched that in the chosen, right? Bring fire down from heaven. Blow them off of the face of the earth. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to call you all the sons of thunder. Like, oh, okay. So later on, they're walking on the path. How'd we do today? Eh, today, not so much. But, you know, it's going to get better. <laughs> I love that. Because it's exactly what we want to do. As soon as we get a taste of power, we turn into tyrannical rulers, and we start commanding and demanding against creation. And we're just being a little tyrant because we were raised by the tyrant of tyrants and the thief of thieves. It's totally natural. I'm not even going to criticize you for doing it because I did. I stepped into spiritual warfare because the devil brought a sickness on a loved one of mine and I didn't get my way. So I took it on myself to be the burr under his saddle and I waged war. Day in, day out, I looked for the opportunity. I got into deliverance. I got into... I'm working with the Holy Spirit. I'm working with Jesus. I'm doing everything I can to be pleasing unto, uh, unto God, almighty, omnipotent, Jesus, Holy Spirit. And I'm walking in a way that's not even heavenly. What I do wrong. I was never called to battle. I was never called to war. Look at it in the Bible. Look for it in the Bible. It's going to change entire mindsets. It's going to change attitudes. Everything that we're to do, we are to be a standing army. When all else fails. Why? Because we do everything before we resort back to God and go, okay, I need help. Everything I did didn't work. The last thing I always do is get with Jesus because I didn't need to go any further. I got to the answer. Am 
my truck didn't start. I had to go and do this and do that. And, and I've called everybody under the sun and I finally got a wrecker and, and it was going to be three hours before it came out. I finally said, Jesus, what am I supposed to do? And he says, there's a charger with a quick start in the garage. Oh, cool. Thanks. I immediately got to the answer. Do I keep looking for an answer? No, he just gave me one. So he created the last place that I looked because he was the last one I checked with that actually fulfills the answer. He was the only one to fulfill the answer. So if I would have checked with him first, I would have found out about the charger and the quick start before I called 23 people on a wrecker wasting two hours to find out I'm going to wait three more. And the answer was in the garage the whole time. Oh, <laughs> but we all do it. It's not condemnation. It's acknowledgement, right? And there's no sense looking for an answer after you just got one. So Jesus is the last place we check. Even if he was the first that we called. That's what we need to learn. When he's the first person, when he's the first to be called, I get to my answer. So I'm dealing with spirits. We need to look back into the fruits of the spirit. See, they will be known by their fruits. We will know the spirits that we go up against because of the way they act, the way they do. Now, here's the tricky thing. And this is a lot of reason why there's a lot of churches that don't want you playing in the spiritual. On our own, can we actually decide what is good and what is bad? Through the unction of the Holy Spirit, we're going to find out that answer. So 1 John 4, 1 through 6, literally tells you there's many spirits in the world, but this is how you test the spirits. You ask them, which means you speak to them. Isn't that interesting? Didn't have to yell, didn't have to do anything else. You speak to them. Did Jesus come to the earth in the flesh? Now, one thing you'll learn about the spirits are the bad guy side can't tell the truth and the good guy side can't tell a lie. Now you're going to know them by their fruit. That's the activity of testing the spirits. Now, the first thing that we do, we encounter a spirit, we freak out, act like there's a ghost in the house. We start commanding and demanding and tell them that we bind them up and send them to hell. Whammo. Problem solved. Except there might have been a little problem of the Michael class angel that came to visit you who is now bound and sent to hell. In your majesty, you have the authority to bind them and send them wherever you say, but you just cast a judgment on an angel without sin and sent them to hell. I was amazed when Jesus had me release the, uh, the holy angels that were being shackled and held in hell. And I was like, oh, wow, what a cool prayer. And then I went, oh, wow, how uncool is that? How many angels have we sent incorrectly to the wrong kingdom? Whoops. Our assumption is always in the negative. We presume anything is going, it, it, we approach things in fear. Therefore, it has to be bad. But Gabriel started out with the shepherds and said, do not fear. It's a good thing they didn't start commanding and demanding, huh? 
They got to find out the birth of a savior. But he had to start out. Hang on, y'all. <laughs> Don't get crazy. I'm not here to harm. How many of us stop and listen and wait long enough to find out? How many of us actually inquire with the testing of the spirits? So before we all of a sudden start pulling out our sword named kindness and our shield that we're going to just turn into the turnbuckler of turnbucklers, we need to, we need to take that moment because in who you are and the authority and power that you walk in with the Holy Spirit, you are called into this power. You are called into dominion and majesty. So you are a king slash queen that walks in dominion over all of creation with power and authority. That's who we are. It's not, that's who we're going to earn ourselves to be. It was declared, therefore it is. When I don't question my power, authority, majesty, or for that matter, dominion, then I accept it by faith. If you start doubting, you hand it over to the enemy. I had to learn when I pray healing prayers, I don't need to ask myself questions about it. All I know is I was obedient and it's his job now. What did I do? I spoke the words as it is in heaven here on earth. I stand on James 5, 16 through 21. Are you afflicted? Then pray. Oh, didn't work? Call upon the elders. Because the prayer of faith shall heal the sick. When I call upon the elders, everybody brings their 20%. And then I can get to 100% faith. If I prayed and it didn't work, I need to actually invoke more faith. Bring up here. Pray together. One person can set a 1,000 to flight. Two can send 10,000. That's your backup. Oh, but the church will tell you, we can't work with angels. Why not? Aren't they the army of heaven? Didn't they accomplish everything God needed so Father never leaves the seat of the throne? Well, if that's the way it works in heaven, aren't we called in the kingdom prayer to bring it from heaven to earth? As it is in heaven here on earth. It's not poetry. It's natural law. It really works. It works for the unbeliever. So it's not a part, it's not about the private club, you know, to call church. The worker of iniquity did all things the Pentecostal church is known for and was told by Jesus, well, I don't even know you. Be gone. What did he have? He had natural law. And he did these things in Jesus's name. Therefore, the law was staged and it worked. But he did not have relationship with Jesus. He said, I don't know you. So you can be a Pharisee, you can be a Sadducee, 
you can be an atheist and speak it in Jesus name and it works because it's the law. Don't learn the law without relationship. The whole thing is about relationship with Christ. Can we have freedom? Yes, Jesus' intent was that we be free and free indeed. So do I have a problem in deliverance? Absolutely not. You got to go. Do I have to yell and scream? Am I throwing a temper tantrum? Am I literally creating the need of somebody being delivered again because they went through deliverance? They don't understand why you're yelling at them. They just know somebody's yelling. Did Jesus lift a finger, jump, hoot, and holler? Legion, 5,000 spirits in one man. He says, y'all just need to go on over there, those pigs. And I promise you, I, he probably spoke softer than what I just did. Why? He operated in authority. He knew who he was. He knew he walked in the power of law. He was a man. He was not God in the flesh. He was full-blown fleshly man without the aid of angels, but he knew who he was. He came to the earth underpowered so the devil had no excuses. We have more backup and support than what Jesus did while on earth. That's an amazing thing to actually think about. I always thought he was just like, yeah, well, he was, you know, God, you know, I mean, he walked through and, you know, he, yeah, he knew he's going to get those miracles because they were his miracles. No, he gave us the perfect example. He knew when he asked father, that father was perfectly faithful and he was going to answer his request. Now I know Jesus catches my words. Every time I speak them, I don't even have to question it. But my biggest thing I need to do before I speak my words is ask them, what do you want me to do here? When looking at the military, does a soldier go out and make a battle plan? They take orders, they're told where to go, and they they're told what to actually accomplish. So the soldier just needs to be obedient. Do they even have to know the game plan? Absolutely not. Do they know that there's a 16 other squadrons that's going out into 16 other areas and and only if they have the possibility of crossing paths with each other would they even know, that somebody else is even doing something. All we have to do is be the foot soldier. But we might want to ask for our orders first. I make fun of, and I shouldn't, but it's the nice little ladies in the back of the church. They're the prayer warriors. They'll pray down heaven, and I hear them all the time. Well, let my son just... Just no, don't bring any harm to my son. Just protect him. I know he's going through the bars. He's a drunkard. And, oh, he's got the taste for drugs. And, Lord, just protect him. Well, how's the Lord ever going to get to him if he doesn't actually crash and burn? If you're not the insect that bounces off the windshield that doesn't have the guts to do it again, that's when you meet Jesus. It's the third bounce on the fall that you go, oh. I need some help. <laughs> and then we actually get in through that. We're, we start finding our way with Jesus. And then we start realizing we're not orphan. We weren't put out here to be on our own. We we're put out here to learn how to receive relationship and work, co-labor with Christ. We always hear about accepting Christ and salvation, but we don't hear about how Christ Ask us to step into his heart. 
I and he and he and me. Ho, ho, ho. Now we're talking. You want to talk about co-labor? We work together. I don't go off and fly off on any more on my own very often. <laughs> because I still sometimes step into it and I get a little overzealous. But I need to work with Christ. Let's go to Acts 19. By the way, I don't know whose who's, uh, lesson I'm stepping all over, but I saw a little glimpse of that. Oh. <laughs> Justin said, get off his notes. <laughs> uh, sometimes we need to hear this more than once, especially men. We need instructions at least twice. For real. I'm not making that up. Acts 19 is a very, very interesting chapter. I'll start. At, are y'all there? All right. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They responded. No, we haven't even heard of it, that there's a Holy Spirit. Then he said, well, into what then were you baptized? They answered, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized in the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in one who has to come after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there was about 12 of them. He entered into the synagogue. Here we go. He... I just wanted to make sure I wasn't going where I thought I was going. He entered into the synagogue and for three months, he spoke out boldly and argued persuasively about the kingdom of God, kingdom of God, Holy spirit. Okay. Synonymous. I always thought that was heaven. i never realized that that was the spirit given to us. When some stubbornly refused to believe and spoke evil of the way, before the congregation, he left them, taking the disciples with him, and argued daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Now, know this. They were struggling with new belief. They really weren't sure what to do with Holy Spirit. They didn't know anything about it, except power came upon them. Holy Spirit is the standard holder. So, I'm going to skip the part where Paul's healing people and, and working with the Holy Spirit. Okay? I'm going to jump down and read 15 and 16. Because this is how important walking in your prayer closet, knowing you have Holy Spirit, because he empowers us. It's not us. It's him in us. So I, I say it all the time. It's got to come to us to go through us. Now, if we're walking in the flesh, coming to us to go through us goes nowhere. If I'm in the spirit, it comes to me and I ship it right out. That's how leaving my door open 
leaving, walking in my prayer closet allows me to operate in the spiritual and I'm equipped in the flesh. I'm deaf, I'm dumb, and I'm walked all over. <clears throat> 15. The evil spirit said to them in reply, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. But who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leapt on him, mastered them all, so overpowered them that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Y'all, they just got their butts handed to them. Why? <laughs> this is the reality of spiritual warfare. But I want to tell you, the enemy's powerless against us. If we are in order. If we have Holy Spirit. If we are in the Spirit. If we don't, you can't fake it till you make it because you're going to get your butt handed to you physically. And that's just the reality. Now, am I trying to make the devil more powerful than he is? No, he's powerless, but he is, but he can whoop on the flesh. If I do deliverance, I may get checked up later on. They want to make sure that I'm in good standing. It's common. It's frequent. The week after encounter, after we've had a bunch of guys come through that next week, it, it can have a lot of potholes in it. And I look at it like, um, uh, like the defense of a football team. When you run out there, if you're a wide receiver and you're going to go, he's going to come up and check you in the first five yards. After that, he has to run with you and try to block you. But he can come up and push you in that first five yards to, to blow your timing. Well, the enemy will do the same thing. They're going to check you because deliverance is a judgment. We're not told that we're not allowed to judge. We're just told we'll be held accountable to that same level. That's an important little tidbit to know. So an adulterer got no business freeing somebody from adultery because they can't pass the standing. Make sense? That, that strong man is going to check you and he's going to find you got room in your house. I mean, they don't want to be outside of a house and you just kicked them out of one. So they're looking for a new address. So make sure your standing is good before you start knocking others out of their territory. Okay. Acts 19 was probably the most important lesson that could be taught. Because there's a lot that's willing to fake it till they make it. And that's not a place in spiritual warfare. There is no place with that. They know they'll see right through it. You can't fake it because they know who you are. And they know who you are even better when you're in Christ. Notice, I know Jesus and I know Paul. I don't know who you are. You don't want to be in that place. So when it comes into the warfare, how do we stand? We try all things. And then, and then stand. Because he knows our nature. It's kind of comical. But we really do. We try everything under the sun. And then we go, oh, yeah. Hey, Jesus, I need a little bit of backup here. <laughs> I talked about it earlier. So we're called to stand. They recognize our authority. 
they know we're actually kings. And until we actually start standing in that kingship, until we start operating in that dominion, all of creation is groaning because we haven't stepped into our role just because we don't know who we are. I'm going to bring more about this and I'm going to bring more into the standing. I don't have time tonight. And I think I've probably already whopped you with a lot of info. So I think we're probably at that point that I'd like to actually bring us kind of back around to operating in the spirit. And it's a good practice at first to close your eyes, to get quiet and, and ask for the spirit to come upon you. He's already in you, but you're giving yourself the opportunity to feel his presence. That's where you need to be before you do anything in prayer. And I don't mean any kind of prayer. I mean, every kind of prayer. If I'm not sitting in the throne with Jesus, how effective am I, am I really going to be? Is there any other place my enemy is actually made to be my footstool? No other place in the Bible have I found the enemy to be under my feet. So I better sit in the throne when I'm praying. That's my place. I and he and he and me so we can go be, be what? Ruling and reigning as we are supposed to. Jesus never did it tyrannical. He never raised his voice and he was never seen running to be on time. We just move along with him to work for him. And our part is speaking life and death using the power of the tongue in his will and his timing because he just told me and I'm going to be obedient. Does this make sense? Might be a little bit to chew on for a while. It's okay. But just know, if you can see yourself sitting in the seat with Jesus, you're there. If you see Jesus standing next to you, he's there. I call it the blackboard of the mind. I really almost could get in trouble with this. Because he's not really in your imagination, but he is your imagination. So to back this up, look how many times in the Bible, I is spoken singular. Hmm. We have two eyes, though. Until we get into the spirit. And then we see through one. So every time that the, you come across the writing in the Bible of I. It's speaking of spiritual sight. And that's why I recommend we close our eyes so we can see the TV on the backside of our forehead and see what Jesus is showing us. You don't even have to pray with your eyes closed, but it's a good exercise to actually start out so you're focusing on watching the TV of the mind. Now, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to break it right here so we can actually <clears throat> I've given plenty for a lot of good questions. This can go all over the place. So, um I'm going to open up the floor.
And I think this is actually a good spot to actually encourage people's questions. So there should be floodgates open. <laughs> mm. Okay. I, I, I do already have a question, so I might as well actually throw it out there. <clears throat> um, the deliverance prayer and the example was adultery. Um, when we're checked up afterwards, we basically really feel the kickback of the enemy to see, are we in good standing? So it doesn't have to be the strong man is checking to see, are you in good standing on any bad fruit? Because if you're, if you're actually passing prayers in hypocrisy, the enemy is going to check you and you're going to get busted right then. So that's where if you're still learning lessons, bring somebody else in. The biggest mistake I think a lot of people do is have healing prayers by themselves and they never ask for the others to come join them. The more we have come in, the more faith we operate with, because I just added 20% with five people. And so we got to, we'll call it 120%. Well, that's the prayer of faith that shall heal the sick. If I didn't have enough on my own, don't just pray again. Bring people in. It's not any, it's not a slant on you. It's we were designed to work together. That's why Dominion has us not over one another because we're all peers. And, and I have Achilles tendons that are different than other people's Achilles tendon. So let's pull the prayers together, bring the prayer in of multiple people and watch what happens. So we got a hand up. Um, iPhone? <laughs> yeah, that's saying that they don't have a name. Whoever put their hand up in the chat, come on. Whoever called in on the phone? That would be Eric. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe a silly question, but I got to get this right because I've got a scripture going in my head. Come through Come to the Father through me. So am I praying for to Jesus or God? Because I, I know I understand the Trinity. I understand well, that. We gain access through yeah. Jesus to get to the Father. But am I praying to God or am I praying to Jesus? Yes. yes Sorry. Right. <laughs> but that's the rule of omnipotent. <clears throat> They're in absolute unity, although we can know them individually. So with, to address one, what am I? Three here. What's that? To address one, all three here. Yes. Okay. So it's odd to say yes to that because our logic would not agree with that. But well, yes, say you answer. <laughs> hey, I mean, you were talking about you know mainly talking to Jesus and stuff, so having a relationship with him yes you know and I, I know that he was in the flesh so yeah I, uh, I actually i stand on that from exodus 23 25 because father says i give you the lord to be your god but don't worry i'm gonna remove sickness from the midst of thee bless your food oh I guess it's actually bless your food and water and remove sickness from the midst of thee. So we got a little glimpse kind of just tucked right in there, but 
father gave us Jesus. He's the one that actually earned us. And he said, don't worry. I still got you covered for your food and your water. I'm blessing your food and your water. And don't worry. I'm still going to pull the sickness from the midst of you. That's a really cool promise. Thank you, Father. But he gave us the Lord to be our God. Well, I find that I, I really have found that comforting because Jesus really, after the cross, he had earned us. He bought us. I've just found it was inter interesting that we got a glimpse of roles in authority, although one and the same except you've got to go through Jesus because Jesus actually paid for us. There's our salvation. Now, once we pass by that, we're free to go check in with Father. And we're free to check in with Father from that point forward. And we don't have to go, hey, Jesus, can I go see Father? The door's open. Once you've been once, you can go over and over and over again because that access way was made open and it only had to be one time to be forever accepted. I had to learn that. It was a long lesson. I really thought, okay, I got to go back to Jesus. Now I've got permission. Now I can go see Father. No. When I accept Jesus, I made through the door. I went to Father. And from that point forward, forever. I'll be able to go straight to Father if I if I need or choose to. Sometimes we just need a daddy. Sometimes we need the teacher. And sometimes That's what I, I need was a, gonna say. Uh-huh. Sometimes I need a, I need a graceful savior and friend. But all three of them are going to come to me and love me. Go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, nah, that's okay. It answered my question. Thank you. All right. I'll go. So I, th this is... I had a really unique experience this week with um, a very dear friend of mine that went on to the afterlife, went on to, has been struggling. And in that spiritual warfare where you talk, Craig, I talked about being as spiritual and when you, to walk into that place where you are in your chamber and whether it be with people or around people or, you know, in the midst of nowhere in a hospital room when his wife asked me if I would pray with them and pretense in that we had a long conversation. He told me, you know, he said two years ago, he said, I prayed trying to find my faith again. And I asked God to give me a reason to come back to church to show me why I needed to put him back in my life. And shortly after that, he was diagnosed with cancer. And he and I have kind of walked back to our faith together. And, and in that moment, I had no idea what to say. I didn't know what to pray for. I didn't know what to do. But I remember you saying, just close your eyes and ask and say, hey, I need your help. And kind of hitting on what we we're just talking about, you know, when, when you talk about the Trinity of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, it, it kind of gained for me in my walk with faith and re- coming back to that door and opening that door, walking back in to kind of, you know, when we walk in the spiritual world with the Holy spirit, 
Jesus is there as our is our go to as our teacher to walk beside us and help us and give us the guidance that we need to get to daddy to get to father so when we have that that hiccup when we're walking in spirit when we need a little bit of a push or we need a little bit of help he's like your brother your ride or die your your right hand man you know in the world where where we, we do we we in our daily jobs we have people that we count on to be right there beside us and that's what Jesus is. He, he's, he's right there with us when we have that hiccup. And we can reach for him. And he's going to guide us to say, hey, this is where dad wants us to go. And, and then my question is, is in that spiritual warfare area, Craig, is... You know, like you were talking about, we, you know, the answer is always there first. We'll look somewhere else. We do everything else first before we just say, oh, well, you already told me that. So why don't I do that now since I've wasted all this other time? In that, you know, when we say kill them with kindness and all these other things that are millions of mantras there that we could find. It's very hard to dis distinguish between, you know, you, you read and you always say that they, you know, older elders and older people of the church have always said he's going to test you. He's going to put something in front of you to test you to see where you're going to go and what you're going to do. And in that, in that, whether it's whatever the situation may be, whether it's you know, you're standing in line at a grocery store and the cashier's berating the person in front of you for, for something seamless. How do you, de what do you do to determine when I'm a violent person, I have a bad temper, but how, how do you determine in that spiritual warfare when, hey, is this, is this a point where I'm being tested to where I need to intercede for this person on their behalf because they can't do it versus, yeah, just be quiet and stand there. That's a struggle for me to, to understand that in the spiritual world, because I know in the secular world and not trying to be godly and do the right thing, I just blow a gasket and, be done with it right then but is that really is there how do, where's the determination and distinguish come in there where you're not doing it maliciously but you are pushed to do it spiritually okay <clears throat> um let me share with you what I've learned in scenarios. The scenario of an inconvenient moment when I have when I have a decision to make and it's very inconvenient, that comes from Jesus. The more inconvenient it is and the more that I've actually got to make a decision, am I going to go this way or that way in a very inconvenient time? That's Jesus every time. Jesus sets us up for success. The devil tests us. So there's scenarios that we run into when we're in a testing the testing's for our endurance. But I want to clarify something. When I stand, I'm still to use my tongue. And I have to ask, do I feed life into the subject or do I kill it with death? So when I speak to cancer, I speak death. 
Am I killing the person I'm praying for? No. Cancer didn't come from heaven. And it can die. I'm not friendly about it. Now, do I pray for the recovery and the good health of that person? Heck, yeah. So you speak life and you speak death. I don't think we speak enough death in the appropriate places. We're too busy speaking death just because we're negative. And I, I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. There's a huge difference there. So the test comes from the enemy and the test gives me endurance to make the race. I'm going to make it to the end. Jesus sets me up for success every time, but I find inconvenient timing. <laughs> and just if you always remember, oh, this is inconvenient. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it'll prove itself out. It's amazing how that proves its way out. <clears throat> Those inconvenient times really is the best. It, it's, it's as long as you recognize that, choose, choose the path of inconvenience because he's directing you. It really is. It, if it was going to be easy, he would have put us on a slip and slide and called it our race. They're all lessons and they're all learning, but he sets us up for success and the devil tries to trip up, trip us up for his success. And it's a great strategy. Just ask the question. If you stop and ask the question, is this inconvenient? You'll know where it's coming from. And you'll even know the answer because you're going to, the answer is always the most inconvenient. Man, I, you know, uh, what was the disciple that actually was, uh, Jesus asked, the, uh, Jesus asked a man if he would join him as a disciple. And he said, man, my dad just died. I've got to go back and bury him. And Jesus said, well, let the dead bury the dead. He was never spoke about again. And he didn't make the inconvenient choice. But the opportunity was there to be a disciple. And instead, he felt obligated to be the dead to go bury the dead. We do it all the time. It's not in condemnation. Recognize the strategies. You'll know who's messing with you and who's helping you. Does that help answer your question? Okay. All right. Who's up? Who else is up? I'm really surprised. I thought I was going to rattle some cages and get people from every corner going, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Shannon, what you got? Oh, you're muted. You're still muted. You're muted. There we go. All right. I hear you. So what kept grabbing as you was talking, when you got on the part where you mentioned the vessel, that just grabbed me. So that's what I've been doing over here, just reading through and writing notes as you were speaking. Um, if you go over to uh, Romans chapter 9, and this is hitting all the way around everything that you were talking about. I'm going to read this. It's a long read. It's uh, verse 6 through verse 21. But it has so much meat about what you're talking about in this set of scriptures, I got to read it. So verse 6 says, but it's not that the word of God has taken no effect. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Nor are they all children because they are seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That 
that is, those who are the children of flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah, uh, Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebecca, when Rebecca also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor have done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It is said to it, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What shall we say then? Is there, is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom, whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then, it's not on, then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who wills, nor of him who runs, uh, yeah, God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? With a thing formed, say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay for the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? When I read that, it just, man, my whole, my light bulb came on. What that's saying to me and speaking to my heart right now we have to understand that we look at this life wrong as a whole in the mankind. When people die, we say it was their end. It is not their end, it's their beginning. Mm -hmm. So we can't focus on this life that we're here to live in the way like it's just the total, because the total is the ending going into eternal. All right, so that's the first thing. The second thing is we must understand that we are all created by who? By God. So we are tools of him for his use and his use alone. And Craig did a very great job of running this down. And my mind was working through different rabbit holes and it just sold me at vessel. We cannot concern ourselves with fleshly desire and expect the Holy Spirit to work through us in the way we desire it to work. We can't, it says, for those who die or lose their life shall gain it. All right? You know what that means? For those that push away from your fleshly desires and solely want the will of the Father through you, those are the ones that will get their life, will win their life, will have life in abundance because you're in full submission. When we step away from the flesh, uh, it, it's one scripture, and I've read it, and I've read it, and I've read it, and it finally comes to me tonight. It talks about a virgin and a married woman. And it says the married woman will spend her time trying to please her husband, but that virgin will spend her time trying to please God. That is in there for a reason, not speaking on against marriage, but it's showing the purpose that we must have. Our purpose in this life is to just like he used Pharaoh to spread his gospel, to talk about our father, to talk about his goodness, his mercy, his grace. This is our only job. Our sole purpose in this life is to spread that gospel. It says not everybody that come from Abraham are Israelites. We're those folks because we're believers through adoption. So when we get to focusing in this, now we get to understanding that the Old Testament has things that applies to us. As believers, we understand that the Old Testament is not just a wash that we can just throw it away because we're in a New Testament church and now Jesus is coming, all this. A lot of that stuff is under the same application today that we are supposed to live with a purpose, that we are supposed to live in the will of God, 
not our own. Those people back in the Old Testament had to do things strictly in order to please God because they lived in the law. But now we think just because we got Jesus and Jesus died on that cross that we can do whatever we want and have all the will of the flesh and still carry on about our day to day. No, no. If the Lord says 70 years, you get it on this planet. You can't live 69 like you want to change your life in the last and expect just all bells and whistles. We're going to go through testing. We're going to go through trials. We're going to go through a lot because the word says this and the word is the truth. Once we understand that we're vessels made by the potter, he formed us in a particular way. He formed us to hold one thing, the Holy Spirit. And that right there is power. Power to do things. Why? The laying of hands that Craig spoke about. The speaking of tongues. All these gifts that come through the Spirit. Why are we able to do these things as a vessel? It's for the glory of God, not the glory of Shannon, not the glory of Mike, not the glory of Craig. It's to glorify God, to make believers out of non-believers. And this is where we get it messed up. If we are operating in self, we'll never tap into what Craig is talking to, talking about on that spiritual side. The farther you get away from flesh, the closer you're going to get to God. The farther you get away from your will, the closer you are to fulfilling your purpose in God's will. This is why he created us. I'm a firm believer in this, and Craig, correct me if I'm wrong, that our spirit was created first, and then our spirit was placed in a body at a predestined time in God's will to, for purpose, to do certain things, to appeal to the nations, because it says his gospel is going to reach every corner of the earth. Well, he's got to have a Sammy, because Sammy's built in a particular way that will appeal to people like Sammy. He's got to have a Shannon, because Shannon appeals not to everybody, but to a group of people. He's got to have soldiers, as Craig says, do not question the orders of your commanding officer. Us as ex-military, we know that. We are drilled in that. Two and a half months of basic training where they break you down mentally, physically, every way possible to get you to observe that you do not question the orders of your higher in authority. But swap it over to the uh, spiritual side. Why do we question God? He is the highest authority. Jesus is the highest authority. And everything that we read in this word that it tells us to go do, we should not question, we should do. Because we're soldiers of his, we're vessels of his. He created us. So when we move forward, oh God, do I have to do this today? I really want to do this over here. Oh God, don't. I really don't want to talk to such and such or bring the gospel. Look what happened to Jonah. Jonah didn't want to go take the word to those people in Nineveh. He didn't because he thought they were unworthy. We laugh and joke, but that's us too on a daily day basis because there's some people out there that offend us. And when the Lord moves on your heart, if he gives you an assignment, it don't matter who it is. You best to go do it. That is your command. That is your authority. So when we come off our high horse, like so many people in those four walls of a church that keep their food when they get fed for themselves and don't feed others when they leave that building, when we come off our high horse and realize we are just vessels, then the Lord can work with us. Then the Lord, we fall into his will and his weight. Then we start doing things that are unheard of. It talks about Paul, and he hit this scripture. I forget which one it was. It might have been Ephesians. It was one of them. Well, Paul, if you read on in context, it says, God start doing unthinkable things through Paul, sending pieces of his clothes out, and people were healed because Paul was in full submission. Paul's whole, his entire being was not grieved, but in repentance in all of what he had witnessed of God to be Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. So in that full submission stage, this man's clothes, his co- pieces of his clothes, y'all, this is what gets me. Pieces of his clothes were used to heal people. You know, these people that used to sell these bottles of water on the internet and on TV and these pieces of prayer cloths and all this, 
and send it out for $9.99, you get this prayer cloth and you'll be healed. That's a joke. Paul was not a joke because he was in full submission. And if everybody, every one of us on this group, there's 18 people on this group right now, was to go in full submission right now, wherever you are, people would be saved at that moment because of your submission. This is what we're called to do. This is why we were created. And if we sit there and we dwell in our own desires of the flesh, that ain't fair. That ain't fair to Christ for what he gave for us. That's not right. I don't care how you look at it, ain't no shade of gray. Every time we don't fall in line with daddy's will as Mike, I like daddy's will, and we operating in our own, that's a spit in Jesus Christ's face. I don't care how you look at it. Because he come and paid the ultimate price. We, he paid for us to give us a chance. He gave up his life. So now we owe him. He says to pick up your cross and follow me. Well, part of that is that, well, most of that is dying to the flesh. From the simplest to the greatest. In my heart, it says perfection. And I had that in notes. Noah, it says he was perfect in several translations. Job, it says Job was perfect and upright in several translations. I just had this talk with my youth Thursday. It says these men were perfect. Enoch said, it said about Enoch, Enoch walked with God and he was not. That man didn't even die. How were they perfect and in the flesh? Their heart. Their driven spirit. Being in repentance, like Craig was talking about, full time. I know I'm not worthy. Father, I'm here in full submission. Have your way with me. This is what he saw as perfect. Not as in, I ain't never smoked. I ain't never drank. I ain't never... Like we purpose in our mind to think what perfect is. That's how you get set up for failure. But that heart, he looks at you. He looks at your heart. He examines your heart. How many times does it say that in the word? When your heart is purpose to please him. David was a man after God's own heart. And ain't nobody messed up more than David. We know this. Time and time and time and time. He got a whole book called Psalms where most of it he was crying. Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me. But that man was after God's own heart because he stayed in a state of repentance. He, the reverence he had for God, the love that he shared, the relationship that he shared, that he could sit down and tell him what he had done and how sorry he was. And it wasn't just a, a play. It wasn't just a prop to get what he wanted. It was he was really hurt in his heart that he allowed himself to dip into the flesh and do these things that he knew better. He knew better than and this is what we got to be. It's vessels. It's got me. It's, it's put me on a state of mind right now. Lord, I, su I submit. I submit. If don't nobody else want to submit with, with me, then I'll submit. Because right now, Cornelius, Peter come to Cornelius, and by Con Cornelius submitting to God, it said he was saved. And he was given the Holy Spirit. And guess what happened? The whole house got saved and got the Holy Spirit. So it only takes one. So you can be that one in your household. You can be that one in your church. You can be that one in your community. But somebody has to fully submit, fully commit, fully give it all up and go to God and say, have with me as you see fit. Whatever you want me to do, I don't care what it is. Have your way. And when we get in that focused mind, then we can dip over into what Craig's talking about because it's power in that. He loves us. We are his children. I'm his son. Y'all, the men are sons. The women are daughters. How many of you got kids that will let anything happen to your child? None. We want the best for our children. Every last one of them, as much as we can possibly get, our father owns it all. So when we fully submit, do we really have anything to worry about? No, we don't. Not one thing. We have to let go. I'm done, Craig. I'm up. As you say, I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to actually make a piece of logic. There's a lot of people that don't know how to step into the spirit. There's questions about how do I operate in the spirit? And, and I'm going to change things around because when we really learn this, we'll stop being gift grabbers and we'll actually more move more towards the fruits. And it's, and I'm not calling anybody out. Trust me. I, I mean, 
It's natural reaction. Ooh, I got gifts. I got nine presents on one table. Let me tell you, I'm going there first. You know, it's just natural. But there's a prereq there's a prerequisite. Spiritual gifts have to operate from a spiritual location. Fruits of the spirit is the verb of walking in the spirit. Both of them prerequisites you have to be in the spirit to operate in any of either one of them in fruits or gifts you're not going to approach it in the flesh and be successful because you can't operate there from the flesh and i hope that kind of ties things together because i think the biggest problem is we've learned how to be in the flesh and we stay in the flesh and we don't ever leave the flesh and then we don't know why we don't operate in the spirit. You've got to leave the tangible of faith and walk into the verb of faith. There's two kinds of faith. There's the kind you can grab hold of and there's another kind that you can only walk with. And I hope somebody got that answer because I'm not sure what that was. Oh, <laughs> spiritual gifts. There is a prerequisite that you have to be spiritual to operate in spiritual gifts. Just like fruits of the spirit, you have to be operating in the spirit to operate in the fruits of the spirit. So there's your prerequisite. It's being spiritual in the spirit, operating from the spirit that you activate your gifts and your fruits. Good. Um, Mary's got something to, there you go. No? Yes. No. Yes, no, maybe kind of, sort of not. Um, oh, <laughs> here she comes. I, <laughs> I um, I want to go back to the, the deliverance, to speak on deliverance a little bit. And there's, you know, there's, there's the different levels of what I would consider deliverance. So if there's, I'm just going to speak about myself first. If there's something going on in my heart and the Lord is dealing with me, um, where I need to, uh, I need to deal with an issue. It's maybe it could be from my past or it could be something that just happened either way. But it's an issue that where something happened, maybe, or I thought something or said something that the Lord's dealing with me on that. OK. And. When I repent. I'm get I, I'm part of that is I'm I'm allowing myself to be delivered from that spiritual influence we'll say that caused me to misbehave i'm just gonna put it kind of simple terms call you know i listen to the wrong voice if you will and i misbehave so that's a spiritual influence and i've repented so i'm i'm basically being delivered just by doing that now sometimes i have to even go a step further and say satan get thee behind me that still it's to me a form of deliverance and it's just between me and me and god or jesus however you want to look at it to me i feel like my conversations happen mostly with jesus but on occasions, I feel like I'm speaking directly to God or directly with Holy Spirit. But most of the time for me, it's my conversations are with Jesus. So, uh, but anyways, so when someone else, now I'm, now I'm praying for someone else. And they tell me, they say, I need deliverance from 
this, uh, I'm just going to call it behavior. I need deliverance from this behavior because I keep, I keep doing it, even that, even though I don't want to. And, and I prayed about it and I need, I need some more help. I can't do it by myself. And I, I don't seem to be getting any results just praying by myself. So they're asking for deliverance from this behavior. They're looking at it as a behavior, but they know there's a spiritual influence behind it. Okay. So at that point, now, in either case, I'm still going to handle it similarly in that I'm going to in this. Uh, I love being in the spirit realm, if you will. I, I love that because Jesus is right there. And, and there's that conversation going on. Constant conversation. Practically. And so I ask Jesus. What are the words to pray for this person? And a lot of times in that deliverance, it has to do not just with me praying for them. In fact, more God has changed that. Jesus has changed that to where I lead them in a prayer where they repeat the prayer. It's got to be from their heart, I can, I can be in agreement with them and I'm, um, but it's a, it's, that's how the, that's how it works, has been working with me. There's been times when I said, I bind you and send you to dry places, but that was year, that's bit that was kind of a training ground for me to understand the process, but it's changed now. It's, I want them to feel the prayer. When this influence or this spirit leaves them, I want them to feel it and I want them to know it. And I want them to be saying the words because it's got to be their agreement that it's got to go. It's not because I would, that I command it to go or something, which, um, there's not really any need for all of that. When they come out of agreement, when they come out of agreement, they break agreement with whatever's happened in the past that's caused this to linger. That's the first part. But the second part is the exchange, the, the threshing floor exchange to where something comes in so the house isn't vacant. The spirit leaves. Good fruit comes in. Love of God comes in. Or whatever it is that God says. And usually God tells them, not me. And I say, well, what did God tell you? And they say, they, they, they speak it out. And I agree with it. Because it's a good fruit that's coming in. It's a good exchange. We'll just say it's a good exchange. So for me, that's what deliverance looks like these days. I also want to touch on the part about identifying what kind of, of a spirit you're dealing with. If, you, if you're just starting, the scripture that Craig read is very important because sometimes you don't know, you can't really tell, you know something's present, you know something's in the room, but you're not, you can't really determine. And they're all scary. At first, they're all scary because if you read, if you read Revelation, some of the descriptions of what the creatures in heaven look like, if you saw it in front of you, if you saw a, a being that was on fire, that would look scary. But it's a heavenly, you know, it's a heavenly creature. It's in the throne room. It, they fly around. They've got eyes all over. All that looks would sound scary if it were to show up in my living room. So... 
when you're when you're first starting, it's important that you test them all. Test them all. Did Jesus come to the earth in the flesh, born of a virgin? You can go how far, how far you want to go with it. Born of a virgin, died, arose, uh, resurrected three days later. If that spirit is not, if it's an unclean spirit, an unholy spirit, they vanish. the 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 presence leaves. You you. It's no longer there. It leaves. But if that, if you still feel a presence, then I say. Well, if you're if you're from heaven and you've brought a message, state your message. If God sends is God sent you with a message, I want I'm I'm here. I'm listening. And that sounds scary at first, too. But like Craig said, when when heavenly angels came and appeared to man. Almost every time, the first thing they said was, do not be afraid. Because we're going to be afraid when we're, when you start dealing with the spirit, the presence of spiritual entities, it's, at first, it's scary. But your discernment muscle will be getting exercised and will become stronger and you can start to, you know, when, when your hair stands on end and you feel like, you know, there's a certain way that you know it's not good. And it doesn't happen inside my house really anymore because if I hear a knock on my door, and I, I do sometimes knock on my door, and I go to the door, literally, and there's nobody there, I'm not opening that door to look and see if somebody's running off. I'm not doing that. Because the enemy's trying to get me to do a physical move. In other words, if you open the door, that's like inviting them in. Now, I know this probably sounds off, out there, but, um, but I've already kind of, walked to this out where I did open the door and the next thing you know uh turmoil's in the house and I'm having to say look I'm not in agreement with you being here you're gonna have to leave but I don't have to yell or scream I'm like I recognize you're here and I it was uh, I, it was not my intention for you to come in when I was checking to see who knocked at the door so you have to leave. And then that that takes care of it. But I don't go, I don't, I don't do all the if God tells me, if Jesus tells me, bind them and send them to dry places, I, I'll do that. But I have actually said to uh unclean spirits, I said, look, you go to Jesus and ask ask him about salvation. Because I don't, for you, I don't know. But you go to Jesus and ask him about salvation. But I'm telling you, you're working for the bad guy right now. Now, that's that's pretty out there, and we didn't go over any of that stuff. But I would said that because that's what I heard in the spirit to say. And I don't understand all of it. I don't understand everything that Jesus tells me. I don't understand it all, but I believe it because I know it's him. I believe it because I know it's him. And it's, and I get some out there stuff, Craig, you think Craig's got some crazy stuff. I, uh, it's some pretty out there stuff, but it's okay. It's okay. If you, if you don't believe the same way I do, that's okay. It's okay. I love you. And I love you. But anyways, I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> yeah, if you think I'm crazy, she's cray cray. I'm not even joking. <laughs> uh, anyways. <clears throat> um, 
I'm, I really thought that we would actually have a lot more people jumping in and saying, hey, what about? There's no stupid question. It's not, it's not elementary. It's not deep. It's, it's a matter of, I don't have an answer. And that's okay. That's a great place to be. Yeah. And honestly, I didn't, uh, looking into the chat, I didn't actually read the uh, Acts 19, 11 through 14, because that's another way, and we may actually talk about that next week, that's another way of warfare, because even with the articles of clothing and the prayer and the prayer cloths, um, they were set up to free people just the presence and uh I, I like the association of holy spirit with water so just and, and my spiritual father actually would wipe the sweat off his brow and before they left whoever he was ministering with he would give him his sweat rag and he'd tell him for your kids that are struggling, put this underneath their pillows. It was the exact same example they gave in the in the in Acts nineteen. I love that because of the association with the with the water and the sweat, it just it, it just works together. Um, who was first? You know, Shannon. I'm, I'm positive that's Rebecca. She's been patiently waiting. Okay. I, I didn't know. I didn't see the hand. So, uh, Rebecca, what you got? Hey, I'm in the car, so I don't know if my background's too noisy in the back. Do uh, you guys hear me good? Yep, you're good. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to add like a couple things. Um, with Regarding with uh, what Mary was saying about deliverance, just to add to what she was saying, um, is on my end, on my from what I've experienced and what I have seen, um, honestly, a lot of deliverance has to do with agreeing with God. In other words, like the Bible says in um, in John 16, 13 to 15, it says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, or he will not speak on his own, um, on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare you the things that are to come. So the Holy Spirit's job is to lead us all into all truth. So the thing is, when it comes to being, uh, when you need deliverance, it means that somewhere inside of you, so uh, any of us, we have agreed with something that's not true. So a lot of times when it's all about just, and we did that the other session, it's all about cutting ties with things that are lies and allowing us to agree with what God says is true, which brings deliverance to our soul, and it brings an infilling into our, you know, into us, into our, into our soul, where we get delivered from every lie that has been spoken over us, every lie that we've ever believed, and it can deliver us from anything. It can deliver us from sickness. It can deliver us from depression. It can deliver us from, post, you know, like all these issues that people experience when they agree with lies. Um, uh, and, you know, a lot of times that's really what the case is, is really somewhere deep down inside, whether it's when you were a child or somewhere years ago, somewhere you agreed with a lie. And it's an area where the Holy Spirit is dealing with you because he wants you to agree truth on that matter. So we this is something that we experience as we continue to grow with God. There's never a time where we will come to a point where we're completely finished. It's like literally we go from glory to glory. The Lord takes us literally from one thing he delivers us from, delivers us from, then he takes us to the next. And as we continue to hang out with Jesus, as we continue to spend our time with him, we, 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 you know, we begin to grow in these areas and agree with him more and more and more, which I wanted to also jump in to the grace. Um, so, yeah, I mean, regarding deliverance is really from what I have experienced is really that that's like the main root behind it. Yeah, and you know, when we agree with lies, 
we do open doors for different spirits to come in. And we, you know, there's different things that happens depending on the level of the light that you're believing. And all those things take into play. But at the end of the day, the way to get rid of it is honestly just cutting ties with it. Cutting ties with it and accepting what God has to say about that area in your life. And there's where you get your deliverance. Um, and then I also wanted to mention, you know, the grace gives. I wanted to read Ephesians 4. And I, I believe this will bless somebody. Um, and Ephesians 4, and I'm going to read it from TPT translation because it really explains it to the best that, I mean, it describes it very well. Uh, and I'm going to start reading from verse 7. And it says, and he, this is my one of my favorite verses, actually. It says, and he has generously given each one of us supernatural grace according to the size of the gift of Christ. This is why he says he ascended into the heavenly heights, taking his many captured ones with him, and gifts were given to men. Okay, so here Christ gave gifts to men, and these are grace gifts. They're not titles. They're not, uh, you know, they're not things that you that you become it. Because here's what's happening: people are taking the gifts of God and be, and wearing them as titles. They're wearing them as identities. And these were never meant to be. They were never meant to be worn as titles or identities. They're more as a gift to be used for one purpose, for the nurturing of the church. I'm going to keep on reading. It says, he ascended means that he returned to heaven after he had first descended from the heights of heaven, even to the lower regions, namely the earth. The same one who descended is also the one who ascended above the heights of heaven in order to begin the restoration and fulfillment of all things okay so these grace gifts were also they're given to fulfill and restore things that christ already finished the work for so i want to keep on reading and he has appointed and here it goes here are the grace gifts they're not titles they're grace gifts okay he has appointed some with grace to be apostles and some with grace to be prophets and some with grace to be evangelists and some with grace to be pastors and some with grace to be teachers. And their calling, this is the part that I want you guys to see. And their calling is to nurture and prepare all the holy believers to do what? Their own works of ministry. And as they do this, they will enlarge and build up the body of Christ. These grace ministries will function until we all attain. This is the part that I love this part. Until we all attain oneness into the faith. What faith? One faith. Okay. Remember, Christ distributed, a, distributed us a portion of, of faith, of grace, into each one of us, right? There's a certain measure in each one of us. And whatever measure we have, let's use it to the max. And he will increase that measure as we continue to increase, right? And it says, until we all experience the fullness of what it means to know the son of God. And finally, we become one into a perfect man. The whole point of giftings, the whole point of utilizing these gifts is to become one in Christ, all of us together. I truly believe, and this is my opinion. I'm not going to sit, I'm not going to say that this is something that, I, that, that, you know, that I, I know, you know, that God told me or anything, but based on what I have been studying, based on what I've read of scriptures, based on everything that the Lord has been showing me, I truly believe that the day that we all become one in this faith, that we, be, we come to such unity, the manifestation of Christ will literally happen on earth. In a sense where we see that we, we, we talk about his return. We talk about, and there's no timing to this. Why? Because I be, the Bible says that when there's two in agreements, two people come into one, agreeing, the Bible says that the manifestation of God is right there, that he is there. So imagine that the whole world, especially with that vision that I had, the whole world comes into such unity and one faith into one perfect man, which is Christ. If the whole world comes to that, there's no, there's nothing left but the manifestation of heaven on earth, literally on the physical realm. So, you know, and, and the thing is, too, that we've been so caught up on wearing these gifts meaning as titles and oh you know i'm a pastor i'm this i'm that and it's not about that 
every gift that God has gifted us with, the purpose is to draw people closer to his heart, to draw people to the very heart of God. It's not something that we used to boast with. It's not stuff, you know, Paul went to, Paul went to heaven. He experienced that probably visions that he said he couldn't even talk about. And the reason he couldn't talk about it was two reasons. One, it was too much. And secondly, was it going to edify anybody? No. There's stuff that me, let's say you can be exposed to. There's stuff that I can be exposed to, which there has been. But I choose when to reveal them or what or when not to, because it all, the whole point of me even revealing an experience with the Lord is to bring someone closer to Christ. It will never be to boast. It will never be because I want to, you know, tell people, hey, God took me here. And or am I trying to confuse you with different spiritual, you know, awakenings or different spiritual experiences that we have? The whole point is that why God allows us to experience certain things is to use them at the right timing to bring people closer to him, to bring people to the heart of God and to bring people to such unity in Christ and even the transformation. This is what we're called to do. We're called to love one another so we can replicate Christ on earth. and We become all one. And I really wanted to enforce that because I see so much and I'm like, man, people don't get it. Like, it's beautiful that God can use you. It's beautiful that God can show you certain things. It's beautiful to even enter into dimensions where, I mean, people will just be like, what in the world? But what is the point of me saying these things to people? Is it because I'm trying to tell them what God has done to me or am I trying to bring them closer to Christ? Everything that we have, everything that has been put in our hands is to bring people closer to Christ, is to help others find jesus and the best way to start finding him if you're in a baby stage right now let's say you don't know how to the best way is to start agreeing with him and disagree with what you've been taught your whole life disagree with what you've been told to your whole life and begin to agree with the lord and you're going to see transformation begin to happen because it's when we agree that his manifestation happens in us first before his presence can manifest on earth it has to manifest in us and we bring it out into the earth and i just wanted to leave you guys with that because i'm just i'm fired up right now because i just you know this is the purpose of why we use these things is to draw each other closer to the heart of god amen that's what i got to say rebecca when ain't you fired up (laughs) that was good yeah all right, I think Dustin, Dustin's up. Y'all hear me and see me okay? So uh, there is so much that I would like, uh, I guess, like to say and has been said that I have almost written verbatim what uh, has been said tonight about, uh, I guess, many different things. Um, but I guess I'll start with a personal example as, uh, let me, let me take one step, step back. Um, so there's been a whole lot of information that has been given to us tonight where this, this is going to take a week long to chew on and, uh, and kind of, kind of digest because it's been drinking from a fire hose for uh the last hour so um but i guess the very 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 first thing spiritual warfare or or submission or whatever all of this starts about us it's about with with salvation and i'll tell you um in my personal walk when i got saved and i started hearing about how power how we as christians can operate in the power of god and how uh if we submit ourselves to him, then, then God will just use you. You just give it, give yourself to him. God will use you. Give yourself to him. God will use you. Yes, that is absolutely 100% true. But something that Craig said, learning to walk in that is an entirely different story. I love my son with everything in me, and I would give my life for my son. But I'm not about to give my 12 year old my 357 Magnum and say, son, have fun. He ain't ready. <laughs> I mean, he ain't ready. 
you know, and as new Christians, we're not ready to go swimming in the ocean just yet. I know he calls us to come deeper every day, but uh, one of the, I guess I'll say this, one of the personal experiences that I had was in trying to learn how to do that. I started seeing how God would operate through me and begin to use me to speak into people's lives and stuff. And then I got a little proud because I began to think, oh, well, 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 God's been using me here. Then, 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 uh, then maybe, maybe I can do this or, or maybe I can do that. And it wasn't long that I began to operate in Dustin's will, not God's will. So in lear and, and, and learning that and realizing, recognizing that I was operating in Dustin's will and not God's will, I found myself in a place of compromise. And like I said, this is Dustin's story. I found myself in a place of compromise. And in that compromise, I found myself in one of the places, I guess you could say, of the seven sons of Sceva. I was in trouble. I was over my head and I didn't know how to handle it. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a daily walk. It's, uh, it's one of those things when, and I, I think I said on here a while ago, the more you submit yourself to him, the more of he, the more of him that, the more of you that he can use. Paul didn't, Paul didn't do the things that he did being a Sunday morning Christian. Paul's walk extended over to Monday morning and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. It was a daily thing. It wasn't something that he just got up and done Sunday morning or, or just got up and got ready reluctantly because it was Wednesday night. Guys, we've all, we've all been there. We're tired, but uh, to do and operate in his will, I must fully submit my own will to him. And I, I guess that's that's my two cents. I love it. <clears throat> his will is a fantastic thing. The biggest movement that you'll have in your personal life <clears throat> is opening the door and waiting for him to fulfill his wishes in your heart so you can go do. That is spiritual warfare. His will, his timing. I'm walking in perfection. Am I perfect? Nope. But I'm walking in his perfection, his perfect will, his perfect timing, and I get to release the mystery. People want to know, how do you get there? How do you do what you do? I'm not special. I don't do one thing that is not available to everyone. Let that sink in. You may do it differently, but it doesn't mean you can't do it. We spend a good majority of our lives asking for things we've already received. And truthfully, we just need to actually start walking in, operating with. Because if we don't exercise, how are we going to actually figure out that it was that faith that opened the door? Jesus touched. Jesus said to the woman who touched the hem of his garment, your faith is beautiful. Because he knew <clears throat> she believed all she had to do is get close to get close enough to touch. He complimented her. The Roman centurion. Oh, you don't even need to come to my house. 
Jesus was like, wow, if everybody else could have that kind of faith, he said, I'd be knocking it out of the park. What was the limiting factor? Nobody can conceptualize the way Jesus works. But the Roman, the Roman officer was like, oh, you don't even have to come to my house. If you would just pray the prayer with me, I believe it's done. Nine times out of 10 were the limiting factor. Nine times out of 10, we want to understand what we do before we do it. And 12 times out of 10, we don't ask him what we need to do. What does he want us to do in this case? That's that orphanage mentality. Well, he doesn't talk to me. Well, no, he doesn't talk to you in the way that you want him to talk to you, but he talks to you. All good daddies talk to you. He may come in dreams. It may come in as an, uh, as an unction. It may be that, that small, quiet voice. It may be revelation that hits you in the back of the head that sounds like your own voice. But I promise you, it's him and it's it, and he's talking. Did you feel it in your heart that that there was that drawing? Did somebody come up on your uh, in your thought process? Were you thinking about somebody when the phone rang and it was them? All of these things actually are exactly what we do. This is, these are ways that we operate in spirit. And a lot of times we don't even know. I qualify as that donkey more times than not. I brag about the accidental prophetic. Because I walk right into it and find out later that everybody was like, oh, 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 man. And I'm like, oh, okay. But I was being obedient. I just walked in the unction. So it came to mind. I said it. I didn't even realize I was doing anything. But operating in his perfect will and timing goes a long way. Obedience, it's incredible. Okay, we blabbed on. Who's got what? <laughs> Sam's got his hand up. All right, I'll jump in here. As we, yeah, as we've been, I mean, Greg, like, man, like I said, man, you're just so, your way, I mean, yeah, I didn't even go there. You're so deep and, and mm, powerful. Uh, thank you very much for this message. It was, it was fantastic. Um, just listen to everybody, and <clears throat> I know when when so getting into in, into the that spiritual um, warfare and getting in the prayer and stuff. It um, it took me a while, not a while, but uh, just that last little statement. You get really, you know, when he's talking to you, you get revelations. He smacks you in the back of the head. You know, um, once I submitted and I understood when I went to prayer that. It, it was it's his will not my will and i'll say that you know I, I, i've learned that once i go into prayer i do i give it to him it's his will what i'm asking for it's not mine i totally give it to you lord it is your will here on earth as is in heaven just but i'm coming to you and once i did that there was <laughs> and then man you know I, you wouldn't believe how many times just hearing somebody talk, the pastor talking, you, Craig talking, Shan talking, anybody, and, and then it'll just slap you. Boom! Oh, I, you know, I understand now. Before, I never, you know, you just did not quite get that, you know. And that's just, and that's just part of that that relationship that God wants, you know, 
us to have with him. And once that 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 relationship gets stronger and stronger, more of those uh, revelations is just going to smack you in the head, and you're just going, "Wow, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord." That's all you know. Every time it's just, it's like, "Thank you, Lord, for showing me that," you know. And then Mike, when you talking about, you know, when when do you know when you get in a situation? Uh, I think Craig really hit on the spot. If it if it's uncomfortable and you're like, I really don't, you know, don't know. I mean, I guarantee you that's most likely the time you need to. Um, but be careful too, you know, really depending on the situation. Uh, knowing you and when you always talk about your anger, pretty much I think you just probably just need to step back and pray. <laughs> don't get involved. <laughs> but no. Yeah, you know, and I've had those, I've done that. And I've heard Shannon say it a few times too before. It's like, you know, man, after it happens, oh, you know, something was telling me to do this, but I didn't do it. And then when you want, you know, afterwards, you're like, man, there it was. I missed, I missed that opportunity. You know, and so again, I ask for that every day too. Is hey, Lord, open my eyes, open my eyes, open my ears. Let me see those those things to me, you know, and, uh, but the closer you get with the Lord in that spiritual realm, yeah, it's fantastic. And submitting is, is a big thing. Uh, I tr truly believe that, you know, once I submitted and truly understand, understood that it is God's will, totally God's will, then man, my, my part of life's been really good. Uh, yeah. A lot of things he just starts throwing at you. Biblically, to read the Bible, things that you know you've read before, and it's just wow, I didn't see that before. Now I understand it, you know, or you know, yeah, just I think everybody got the gist of what I was saying, but that was my two cents. And uh, Craig, thank you again tonight, man. It's fantastic. Um, everybody just stay in prayer, get, get closer to the Lord, and uh, you'll see, he'll, he'll give you all kinds of revelations. They'll slap you in the back of the head. Hey, I was trying to tell you this. <laughs> Love y'all. Hey, I, I'll give you some encouragement. <clears throat> and uh, and and for Michael as well. Um, a testimony. I read a book on spiritual warfare. Uh, I was really, I was just drawn to the book. It was a little book. And I was like, oh, okay, I could probably buzz to that. I found it in a truck stop. And, and I read through there and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to try that. Well, it was rough times at home. Not my, not my current wife. It was my first marriage. And, uh, and so I, I get off the road, I, I get in I, and immediately an argument starts up. <clears throat> Well, I got emotionally charged and I fired back. Rah, 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 rah. I just had to be the chihuahua in the room. And I sat there and I realized, oh, golly, I missed my opportunity. I was going to go do what this guy was talking about, that all I had to do is sit there and, and tell the devil that I'm not putting up with it and thank Jesus for the freedom that we have in him. And uh, I was so bummed. I was like, dang, I missed out. It didn't matter. I left out for the next week. I come back in. <laughs> well, I was like, I can't believe you just said that. I fired back. <laughs> Walked out of that again. Man, I'm never going to get this thing done. I'm supposed to actually be doing this. I'm supposed to say that. And, and I just got emotionally charged and I blew it. <laughs> Another week goes by. <laughs> I come back in. Lord gave me three times a charm. I come in there and it's ha, 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 ha. And I was like, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> I'm ready this time. <laughs> and I just sat there and I just started I just stood in authority and I was like, devil, get thee behind me. Get out of my house. Leave us alone. I got here to be here with my wife and I'm not going to let you ruin it. 
I almost passed out. When suddenly my wife, I literally said that out loud with, at the time, my wife just in my face, just giving it to me. I didn't have time to actually have anything. I, I couldn't have done anything wrong. I walked through the door. So, I, you know, suddenly she's looking around. She looks side to side, kind of figures out where she's standing. She looks at me and says, I forget what I was saying. And I was like, oh, it wasn't that important. I turned around, went over to my recliner chair. It was the most peaceful night of my whole marriage. <laughs> I was just like, I was, in, I was awestruck. Golly, that worked. Wow. That like, no, that like, that really worked. Like, didn't even know what she was saying. How did that work? Oh, I'm not asking. You know, <laughs> you know, it's all I know is, wow, peaceful night. All the oppression, all the oppression in the house, whoosh, cleared. And I was like, wow, this is a trip. Like, this guy said it would work in the book. And then to actually realize that it really did, I was like, Holy smokes. So for everybody who's quick to react or they're raw enough to be in their emotions, see, when people start poking sores, you trigger. Don't worry. Jesus is going to give you another opportunity to get it right. <laughs> if you like it or not. <laughs> it's going to come back around because he's trying to set you up for success. He never said you had to get it right the first time. And, and we all learn, even for the dreamers here, the repeating dreams, go for a different finish. Watch what happens. Your repeating dreams may actually cease because it was a preparation. You could have gone one way and needed to go another. You don't know, but the preparation was actually getting you ready. So when you're ready and when you're doing it in your dream, you're prepared the next day for when it really happens in the physical. We always get that opportunity to set it right and to do good. No matter how many times we got screwing up trying to get back to that, I knew what the answer was. I just couldn't wait to try it. And I was too emotionally charged, thick-headed, and stubborn to actually hit it right. I was being triggered because I was raw. There was a lot of arguing going on in the house. And I was tired of it. But I thought the only way I the only way I knew how to fight back was to argue back. Bite back. Give me some space, leave me alone. It wasn't a good reaction. Third time was a charm. Dumbfounded. What do you mean you don't know what you were saying? I can tell you right now, your blood pressure was really high. <laughs> but it works out. That's Jesus just works with an imperfect kind perfectly. And it is so awesome. Back off of your triggers, relax, and put Jesus in the mix. Ex it, step your authority forward to say, uh-uh, devil, not today. Watch how far that goes. Walking in is literally walking it through. Exercising what it needs to be and not doing what you did yesterday, because yesterday didn't work. And Jesus always sets us up for success. I don't think we give him enough credit. Even though we screwed up, he knew it. He knew we were going to do that. Was he disappointed? I don't think so. Because I, because I know he knows 
Yep, three more times. He's actually going to remember. Here it comes. Okay, we got another one down. We're getting closer. We got another one down. All right. This next time is going to be awesome. Here it comes. Here it comes. High five. Here it goes. We got it right. One time, he's over here celebrating. Oh, man, he's going to remember that for a long time. <laughs> Laughing, cutting up in heaven. It's a, it's a changing of the guard. It's a changing of mindsets. And it's a celebration in heaven all at the same time. Working with heaven is awesome. And all I can do is encourage everybody else to step in. Don't fake it till you make it, but step in. Be a willing participant <clears throat> to practice the kingdom prayer. Not trying to be Catholic. I was put off by that because all the Catholics repeat it all the time. I can't express it enough. It's our job to glorify Father to say he's the most powerful there ever was. Hallowed be thy name. And then move on to as it is in heaven here on earth. Lord, I ain't been there. You're going to have to show me. Give me the mystery. Bring me Bring me what you want to release in earth today. As Isaiah said, ooh, ooh, here I am. Pick me. What is it? Isaiah 6 and 8? Shooting off the hip, but I think that's it. Here I am. Pick me. You just got to show me what I need to do. It's the, it's the starting of the walk in the spirit. Our devotional should actually sound like, Lord, what mystery do you want to reveal to me that I get to release on earth today? What a starting prayer of the day. You'll see Christianity working. It's relationship, it's activation, it's obedience, and it's everything Jesus wanted. Now, and, and then, well, I wanted you to say, and then when those things happen, and, and, and man, the, the joy, the feeling you have when you see that, you know, is is remarkable. Just like you were saying, the three, you know, oh, what I, I didn't do that. They didn't do it. But once you did it and it was there, man, it's like an eye opener. It's like, oh, thank you, Lord. You just get that, you know, that glow, that spirit with you. And he just, he wants you to just, uh, that's right. <laughs> I think next week I'm going to start in Ephesians and actually I'm going to blow your minds with the with the scripture that everybody knows forward backwards and in between I'm going to point some things out that we've read over and we read over and we read over and it was straight up in the instructions the whole time. So next week, we're going to move on into the operation and what it looks like. So um, spiritual warfare is a different is a different thing than what we think. And trust me, my own experience, I fought the battle every day. I waged war every day. It was my job to be a burr in his saddle because he, he took something I didn't want taken. And it fired me up. The end result. I wasted my time playing patty cake with the devil when I could have been worshiping Jesus. And still winning in warfare. I'm a soldier at heart. 
He wouldn't let me get in the military. I literally was there. I argued. <laughs> I fought with the recruiter. And he's like, nope, I'm not signing you. I was like, you better. I'm here to pre-enlist. <laughs> oh, he was so upset with me. He couldn't wait for me to leave. I have that drive. That, and when I find resistance, I lean in. I put my shoulder into it and I plow. It's taken me years to literally how to take my perception of warfare and see what the instruction book actually said and how to do it. I promise you, what you heard tonight and what you'll hear next week, very few churches exercise well, very few churches exercise, first of all. It's not their fault. It's what they know. But walking in it is not walking in it the way that we want to apply it. Walking in it is the way he wants to apply us. And all of that has to be after you break an orphan spirit. He talks to me. He loves me. He guides me. He pampers me. And I go from nugget to nugget. And it's completely different than what I thought it would be. So... With that in mind, I don't know if we've got anybody else. I know we're getting late. So if anybody else has anything, I don't want to cut anybody off. Yeah, honestly, I can't either. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> Next week's going to be even more fun. I'm going to take Shannon's lesson and actually sit there and just blow it up. <laughs> <laughs> You would do that and expect me to sit here and be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to see that big old smile in the background where you're going, golly. <laughs> Anybody has anything? Well, y'all surprised me. You're a lot quieter tonight than I was than I expected. But hopefully there's not any confusion. If there's any confusion, I want it to, I, I want it to let it come up. Okay. I want to answer the questions or, uh, or work through whatever it may be, because confusion is not a part of teaching of the Lord. So, and, and I know mindsets are hard to overcome because when we have that, somebody actually was talking about that. Oh, um, the lie that, that we've got that when we hold on to that lie, it literally, I call that a mindset and the law of first mention in most cases. We benchmark from that lie and we expect a different result. One of these days, we're going to prove that thing right. But it's bad math. It never comes up in the equation and it never works out. So we practice insanity until we stumble across the truth and it makes us so mad that we finally throw away the lie and then the truth sets you free. But I'm telling you, when we've got a lie and a mindset based in the law of first mention, hey, we didn't have anything to actually grade it against, right? We just got a new tidbit of information. Ooh, hey, that sounds great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try that. Never works out. But when you actually fight and argue, because your flesh wants to keep it, when you actually give that up for the truth, that's when you're delivered. And you didn't need 16 people yelling, hollering, and holding crosses over you. And it, it was a battle from within. All you had to do is let go of the lie, and the truth sets you free. It's an amazing thing. It wasn't even, it, even though, 
there was an assignment on it. I'm not even I'm not even going to call it was demonic spirit. All we did was hang on to a lie and we had to fight flesh to get set free. We give the devil too much credit. Just throw a little tidbit in that. Well, if nobody else has anything, if y'all y'all jump in if you do, and I'm gonna hand it back to Shannon otherwise. And love I'm you. Not, I'm not gonna talk. I'm not gonna talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love y'all and I thank y'all for the time. You know, uh, y'all were very attentive. I saw many reactions. So, um, and, uh, and by the way, it really is Jesus. And, and y'all don't need to try to give me a big head. I have to work hard on humility and I'm not joking. <laughs> so. I don't want to be that prideful individual, but I do thank y'all for the compliments, but it really truly is. It's, it's Christ from within and obedience to deliver. All right, Shannon, it's all you. Good job. And when we give you a pat on the back, that's as being a vessel for the spirit to use. That's pat on the back. You're being humble humble enough to let the spirit use you and speak through you. So uh, tonight, I'm going to ask Mr. Dustin Mills to play us, pray us out because that boy is always on fire. He lights me up. Pray us out, Mr. Dustin. And then we're going to end this until next week. Father, we come before your presence tonight. God, we know that you're here with us. God, we know that you hear and you see and you guide and you protect. God, we know these things. And God, tonight, the word that has went forth. God, we asked last, last week, God, that the word that goes forth, God, cultivate in us a clean heart. God, so that the, the, the word that has went forth, God, that the seed that has been planted, God, it fall on good ground so that it takes root. God, it grows. And as we give ourselves to you, God, teach us to love you in the way that you want us to be loved. God, show us who you are. Reveal to us who you are. Reveal to us the things that you want us to do. God, give us the will to submit ourselves to you. Get, give us the, God, the want to and the desire to give ourselves wholly to you. God, to be used of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. See y'all next Tuesday. Men, I'll see y'all this weekend for that fabulous time by the lake. Love y'all. Have a good night. Blessings to y'all. <laughs>